It's clickbait, dude. I don't want you to die welding. I want you to understand how other dudes have died welding. The better to avoid your own date with old Sparky, perhaps the very next time you see fit to hot glue a couple of pieces of steel together. Just got a quick bit of bonus content for you right now. A lot of you tell me in the comments that you're into the home DIY metal fab stuff, and it's kind of a hobby of mine as well. And I thought we'd talk about this today because I see a lot of dudes doing dangerous stuff with welding on YouTube, and I get the feeling that it just metastasizes across the internet because dudes who don't know how to weld see other dudes who say they know how to weld doing dangerous stuff and they think it's okay because one just copies the other and hence this kind of behavior just proliferates, right? And I want to wage war on that today with the top five ways that you can kill yourself while you're welding at home. And I think the place to start here if you're new to the channel is ask yourself, should you listen to me or am I just one of those dicks who claims to know what he's talking about? Well, if you knew, I'm an engineer, I trained as an engineer, and I worked for six or seven years in heavy industry in the railways. I spent six months in a welding bay, fresh out of school, and after that I worked in the welding engineering section and the destructive testing laboratory that they had, which was kind of fun, like not as much fun as blowing shit up, but close, close second, you know, and I worked with a lot of really skilled welding tradesmen and also welding engineers, and I learned a lot of stuff about that, and my thesis at the end of university was the design and construction of a 100-ton calibration rig that we jury-rigged together out of some off-the-shelf components like a big chunk of universal beam called a 760UB113 with some columns at the end and then we welded like a, with a full penetration butt weld a, a universal railway coupler into the center of it and then you hook it all up with a couple of hydraulic rams and hey presto there's your 100-ton calibration rig and when you're putting a hundred tons of load through something and people are walking around and taking measurements. It's kind of a good idea if that doesn't fail. So I know a bit about welding and I don't want to see you get hurt if you have a crack at home. And the reason I'm talking about this is because welding is so accessible. Like I've got a couple of expensive-ish welders, like home expensive, not industry expensive. And I've got a couple of cheapies as well. i got a cheapie here. Hang on. So this is a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful Amazon welder the, from that reputable brand Advilwin. <laughs> and it's so cheap, this thing, that they just about pay you to take it off their shelves, right? It's really cheap. And it comes with a... That's been there since new, but it doesn't seem to impact its performance. And it actually welds, stick welds, quite well. So the barrier to entry is almost non-existent for welding. Now you can get one of these for like, I don't know, a hundred bucks or something, and you're off to the races. Then you just need a couple of bits of metal and hopefully you won't die. Okay, so let's count them down. The number five way to kill yourself welding in the home shop. And personally, I think the most interesting way is to clean down your parts with chlorinated brake cleaner. I mean, it's evil stuff anyway, but when you mix it with welding, it is deadly. Don't get me wrong, cleanliness is next to godliness with all welding processes. Some are more tolerant of contamination than others. The least tolerant process is TIG welding. And probably the most tolerant two processes are gasless MIG or stick welding with gas shielded MIG, you know, gas metal arc welding somewhere in the middle. Okay. The problem with chlorinated brake cleaner is not that it is an ineffective solvent for grease and grime. It gets two thumbs up for that. The problem is the chemical, right? It's tetrachloroethylene, which in America they call perchlorate or simply perk. If you use that and when it gets to 315 degrees, which is not all that hot in the context of welding over the top of it, it decomposes into phosgene gas, which is a military spec chemical weapon. 
and it kills people in very low concentrations. If you get poisoned by it, there's essentially nothing they can do when you front up at the trauma center. So do not use chlorinated brake cleaner ever because it's filthy, reprehensible stuff and bad for you in its unadulterated form, but it is a dead set killer if you mix it with welding. The number four dead set surefire way to kill yourself arc welding in the home shop is by electrocution. And so many people think that this is not possible. Well, oh friggin' contraire. Although I can sympathize with your position if that's what you think, because hey, I used to think that. And then I went to work in a welding engineering section in industry and the head engineer there, I kind of mentioned to him about the electric shock thing and how it was perfectly safe. And he sat me down and he was a really nice bloke actually, but he said, listen here, Sonny, I want to tell you a story. And the story goes like this, okay? There was a guy welding in the railways many, many years ago, and he's doing like stick welding. So he had an electrode not unlike this, and he's working on a table and the table was grounded. So the ground clamp is on the table. So the whole table becomes, if you like to think about it, the negative pole of a big battery and you're holding the positive pole, all right? And the thing that protects you from being electrocuted when you weld is a couple of things. It's external skin resistance protects you and it's also the fact that you're wearing gloves. You wear these big, heavy gloves, okay? These are actually MIG gloves. They're not as heavy as the big, real heavy leather gloves that you'd typically wear when you're just stick welding. So you wear the gloves and they give you an extra layer of resistance, which is why you should never tack anything up without wearing the gloves because, you know, resistance is not futile. Resistance is saving your life, right? And you've got to not be part of the circuit. So your gloves insulate you from being part of the circuit. Anyway, he's welding away and it's his job. It's all he does all day is weld this dude. And he's in a factory in the middle of Australia in summer and he's sweating because it's hot and he's wearing all the PPE. And as a consequence, his gloves get soaked through, right? So he goes like this, he's finished a weld and I'll just do it, I'll do exactly what he did, okay? He's got his welding helmet on and this is in the days before auto darkening welding helmets, right? So he's got his welding helmet on like this and it doesn't auto undarken and just reveal the world around it, right? You've got to flip it up. So they've got a little window in the front that you can flip up or you can flip the whole thing up like this. And he developed this bad habit. So he's got his wet glove on the table like this and he's got a stumpy little electrode holder like this and he used to tip his helmet up like that, okay? And as a consequence of doing that, because it was a short electrode there, he just slipped a little bit like that, and the end of the electrode touched him on the slippery, wet, sweaty forehead, and he completed the circuit like that, because his wet glove had eroded the skin resistance and the resistance of the glove, and it was kind of saturated from sweating for hours. Negative pole, positive pole, through the head, down through the hand, he's dead. So I'd suggest that it is absolutely possible to electrocute yourself when you weld. And one of the reasons why you wear gloves every time, even when you're just tacking something up for a second, is because the gloves are an external extra barrier, a resistance, of electrical resistance, not futile, okay? Definitely not futile. And when they get wet, if it's really hot, you're in the tropics, you're up in bloody Townsville or something and you're building a tray for your Hilux, whatever, and you're out in the sun, and your gloves start getting wet. As soon as your gloves start getting wet, whip them off, put them in the sun, let them dry and get over there and get a new pair of dry gloves and go again. Because these gloves are not just here to protect your hand from heat. They're here to stop you closing the circuit and waking up dead. At this point, we've done two nice quick ways to kill yourself welding in the home shop. Let's do the long-term option, the endurance event, the ticket on the express to Melanoma City. 
My father was diagnosed with melanoma a couple of years ago now, and that was because he worked outside for much of his working life. And I've got to tell you, it is absolutely no picnic. A lot of welders get melanoma as well, and it's because of exposure to UV radiation. The electric arc sprays you with UV radiation. So you should not weld in a t-shirt, you should not weld with little tiny gloves, and you shouldn't weld with an open top shirt or any of that crap. You've got to have a systematic PPE solution that stops your skin getting irradiated because there are so many welders getting SCCs and BCCs and melanomas cut out of them. It's not funny. And you don't need to join their ranks, right? The gloves are a real asset. So don't tack stuff without gloves. And get yourself one of these, which is just a it's a welding jacket. It's basically just a big heavy cotton shirt with a collar that goes right around at the top. Stand by. I know, right? Not exactly red carpet, but your skin is protected from exposure. And it's also quite fireproof. There's a whole bunch of burn marks on this and hasn't gone through yet. So particularly on this side, because I'm left-handed, so I, I tend to support with my right hand and spray this way. And this region just generally gets sprayed with a lot of BBs and this has been quite uh, durable. It's got a fireproof treatment as long as you don't wash it. So after a few months of using it in your fat cave, it kind of smells a bit like you. You probably won't wear it out to dinner anytime soon, but it's a great idea. Apart from the fireproofing, it's a great idea to stop you being continuously irradiated the more you do this. And it's cumulative, right? More UV, more risk. Don't expose yourself to risk of this nature. And you don't have to buy one of these proper welding ones with a little wanky badge on the side. Just get a heavy cotton work shirt. But the one thing I would say about that is as soon as they start to fray, if you burn them a bit and then the cotton starts to fray, that's like kindling, okay? It's a great way to catch fire. So if you've got a real old work shirt and it's got a lot of frayed bits on it, Best stump up the big bucks and invest in a new one, the better not to roam and candle yourself, which probably won't kill you, but could be really, really interesting. We haven't made a bomb yet, upliftingly enough, so let us do that now with Duos, way to kill yourself while you weld at home in your fat cave. And if you were going to make a bomb to kill yourself, WD-40 would be an excellent place to start. And I say this not so that you do this, so that you avoid doing it, dude. Lots of people have very chaotic environments in their own fat cave. There's just shit everywhere, frankly. And having something like this on your welding table is the worst idea ever. I mean, it's a great idea to spray the table down to stop it rusting and stuff like that, but do it when the welder's off and get this the hell out of the way. Because what's in here, okay? Secret formula, obviously, but it's mostly propellant. And then there's the fluid, which is some sort of oil-based thing. So the fluid's gonna burn and the propellant is probably propane. So you've got a thin-walled steel pressure vessel full of propane and flammable shit. So it's like a condensed Molotov cocktail ready to rip and you're going to put it here and none of these are plugged in obviously but your earth lead has just made this the negative pole of a big battery like a big circuit just waiting to be completed and here's you welding some little thing together here and your wd's over here and you think oh that's okay right and you're welding like this and you lift your welding helmet up that's probably the last thing you're going to remember because when the electrode touches the WD, it's going to go straight through the wall and then propane and flammable whatever secret recipe is just going to come out towards you in a big fuck off fireball. And nobody wants that. So what I'd strongly suggest is before you crank up the welder, before you physically go... All systems go for Frankenstein's monster activation. 
just have a look around at the work surface and get things like this, pressure pack cans of paint, and anything else that vaguely falls into this genre and get it to the minimum safe freaking distance. And now the number one way to kill yourself welding in the home shop is kind of what I did today, which was work on a piece of galvanized steel. Galvanized steel is so potentially dangerous, it's not funny. There's actually two effects. One is just preposterously inconvenient and the other effect is deadly. So let's talk about what I did today. I got this piece of post, which is 2.4 long and had 16 holes in it that were superfluous to my requirements for its disposition. It also had a uh, just a big end here, like a, a hollow end, and I didn't want it hollow, I wanted a cap on it. So I filled up the holes and I welded this cap in place. And you might think, well, what's the big deal with that? It's just a piece of galvanized steel. So galvanization involves putting a coating of zinc on the outside of the steel as a protective coating, right? It does the same basic job as paint in as much as when the zinc oxidizes and turns from silver into that gray color, the zinc oxide kind of hermetically seals the whole thing just as good as paint in some ways better because it's self-healing if you scratch it. And it's also electrochemical protection, which sets up uh, the cathodic protection thing against the steel. So the zinc has to sacrifice itself to extinction before the steel can start to rust. And that's why you can drill a galvanized post and it doesn't start to rust where the hole is like catastrophically rust. So galvanizing is good, but you have to understand the hazard with welding. And I was doing GMAR today, which is gas metal arc welding, which is wire feed with a gas shield, all right? It's, this is only 2.5 millimeter wall thickness, so GMOR is perfect for that. It's a little bit tricky to stick weld, although you could probably get away with it if you had uh, good control and technique sort of thing. So anyway, I went for the cheap, easy option, which is GMOR the shit out of it. And what happens when you weld? You can be stick welding it, it's the same problem, okay? The zinc, when you expose it to the arc, it oxidizes. It forms a chemical called zinc oxide. And when you breathe that, it can predispose you to a condition which is just inconvenient called metal fume fever, which is uh, an allergic condition, I think. And basically, it's just like getting a really, really bad, severe kind of fast onset dose of influenza. So that's bad. And they don't really know if there's any long term effects of metal fume fever. But there's a lot of emphasis in industry on avoiding that. And yet, in backyards across the nation, people get out their welders and just weld bits of galvanized steel all day long. And if you took a, a video with your iPhone or something while Muzz and Spanner were doing that, then you just see these fumes come off and their heads would be enveloped. Obviously, a welding helmet is designed in part not just to protect you from the flash, but it's designed so that the smoke bypasses your breathing apparatus, right? to some extent, okay? But you can't really have cross flow, like you can't set up a fan when you're doing GMOL because it blows the gas, the shielding gas away, right? So you've got to have another solution for that. And the easiest solution is to just wear a mask. There's another problem as well though, because with galvanizing, there's a small amount of lead in the coating and the same thing happens to the lead it oxidizes under the influence of the arc and it forms lead oxide, which is a terrible thing to ingest because it's kind of like tetraethyl lead was in petrol all those years ago. It's linked directly to brain cancer and lung cancer and the exposure is cumulative. So do not expose yourself to the fumes welding galvanized anything, no matter how briefly, because Nobody knows what the future holds, but you don't want to open the door to that shit unnecessarily, I'd suggest. So the solution I use is probably overkill for most people. It's certainly expensive, much more expensive than a hood like this and a nice slimline respirator underneath, which is quite effective. But these things are coming down in price. They're the purified air powered respirators. So you wear a battery pack with a filter system on it and it's got a hose like a vacuum hose and it basically blows filtered purified air 
into the mask and there's like a, a gator kind of thing that envelops your head so that you're really only breathing the purified air and what I did when I did this project was I just ground the galvanization off with an angle grinder so I used a nice smooth flap disc and I just took the edges back about 20 millimeters all around the holes and all around here where I was putting the cap in and basically that got rid of most of the galvanizing and then for the residual fumes I wore my Papa hood and that's very Darth Vader I have to say wearing one of those things and I wouldn't do it if I was only doing like one hole that needed filling or something of that nature but I worked on this post for a little while and I just thought you know from the point of view of not exposing myself to as much toxic shit as possible if you've got it you might as well wear it if I was just going to do a small amount of galvanized patching up then okay I'd wear a mask and a conventional helmet if I was on a farm and a galvanized pipe gate was falling apart and I had a I don't know if I had a uh, gasless MIG like a flux core arc welder and a generator on the back of my ute I'd take it out there and I'd do it on a windy day in a crosswind because you know flux core you don't need to worry about the wind you can, it's perfect for welding outside and you don't need to do much prep either because it's quite tolerant of impurities so you don't need to get out your chlorinated brake cleaner and I'd probably just stand upwind and weld the gate up like that. And I'd wear a mask, obviously. So it's a case of horses for courses. But in here, welding in this environment, there's no cross flow. And normally when I stick weld here, I put a fan there and I get cross flow out of it, right? So I can get rid of most of the fume type contamination that way. But welding the galvanized stuff, that's an underrated, hugely underrated in the backyard health hazard. Whereas in industry, welding galvanized steel is kind of a big deal and you'd have a hundred people with a clipboard surrounding you if you weren't wearing the pap or hood when you do that. And if you've ever wanted to sympathize for Darth Vader, then wearing one of those things for a couple of hours is absolutely therapeutic as well. If you work in industry, like if you're an expert welder or a boiler maker or something of that nature, and you think I've left something out, I would so appreciate it if you could let me know in the comments feed, or if you've got some setup at home and you've crossed some other bridge where there's a problem. And I know there's all kinds of ways to blow yourself up with oxyacetylene and things of that nature, but I really did want to concentrate on arc welding today because it's so accessible now. And with the advent of MIG welding, there's less reliance at home on oxyacetylene, but still no shortage of interesting ways to kill yourself and therefore interesting countermeasures that you need to deploy if you'd like to avoid that. I'd love to know what you think in the comments below and I hope you enjoyed this one. I'll see you next time.